Welcome to week three gallery talks. I'm Linda Van Hart, visual arts coordinator for Common Ground on the Hill. It's my pleasure to introduce you to four artists who deal with upcycling, decorative, and wearable arts. We're going to begin the evening with Judy Schoenenbaum. She has known many of the people who work at Common Ground for years, and last year was her first year with us. She does a variety of arts, including some two-dimensional things like mixed media collage, but she's a specialist in upcycling because she really is uh, dedicated to the idea that we need to use what most people would consider waste more creatively to benefit our planet. Judy, let's see what you have tonight. Okay. Yes. Um, the recycling is my, is the religion that I've settled on after being brought up in other stuff. Um, so, and we had a wonderful class this week of uh, teaching different techniques. Um, I, uh, where I lived before in a small town, uh, it was known that people would follow me down the street with bags of old clothes and say, I've got something for you to make a purse out of. <laughs> and I would do it. Um, so I'll show you. Uh, what we, we did this week, we did um, Amish knotting, crochet, um, uh, cardboard weaving, and um, tomorrow we're going to do twining, rug twining. And it was all from recycled stuff, plastic bags. And the first picture, the first slide, will show you. This is all the stuff that I make things out of. So it's you can see it's plastic bags. And it's all kinds of uh, fabrics, and these are uh, fairly thin because these were I was using for um, for hats, and I can show you the hats. So these are some examples. I can go back to go back to me now. Does this go back and forth, or do I? Do? Okay. So this is a little baby hat, and it's all out of scrap stuff. Um, and for the baby hats, I don't put anything plastic in any of the baby wear. So this is all cotton and baby can roll it up or down depending on the weather. And the great thing about this too is that if uh, the baby gets big, you soak this in warm water and you just stretch it and stretch it and you could probably use this hat for a couple of years. Um, this is my beret. It has every color I wear. And uh, so when I'm having a bad hair day, I just put this on. And then this is another beret, just, you know, all different colors. So that's some of the wearable stuff. And I've also made big sun hats and um, hat bands, headbands. In fact, the next slide you can put on. And that will show, I think it has this. Yeah. Oh, so this is cardboard weaving. This is what we did the first day. And um, this is the little looms just make out of cardboard very easy and last year when i when i was there in person i brought a whole bunch of stuff with me and people also brought their other things but this year we just tried to use things that people would have around the house so this is just a little cardboard loom and you can see it's got the beginnings of things and people made little purses they had them warped on both sides so you can warp it all the way around okay and the next one the next slide is crocheting. And this was um this was a bag that I did um when during Occupy LA, during Occupy all over the country years ago, a few years ago. So um we had an encampment in front of the um city hall of LA. And so we had a whole tent full of people cutting and crocheting and everything and uh, a friend of mine made that that little um, tag. Sorry for jumping up and down, but I I do jump up and down. It says 99% um, created by the Solidarity Sewing and Social Club, and we did a lot of these. And then the police came and cleared us all out. So that was the end of that. But um, and this was all old. This is all old T-shirts. T-shirts are really good for this kind of thing. Okay, and the next one. 
And this is also crochet. Oops, let's go back one. That's a, a hat band. It's my brother-in-law's hat, and uh, he was craving a band, so I made that for him. He's in Baltimore. And um, I also made these hat bands with um, wire in it so that you can hold on. So this one has wire in it, so you can wear it on any hat you want, or on your head, and you can make it into a little floral thing, or wrap it in your ponytail, or however you want to do it. And I had one young woman that bought bought one, and she um, she wrapped it around her arm, and she just wore it around her arm like a snake, so that was pretty good. And I'll show you a couple other crochet things. You can go, oh yeah, good. Okay, so this is this is going to be a big bolster. And this is all um, just um, all kinds of old clothes. Some of my very favorite ex-husband's shirts. And this I made out of, um, is crocheted out of videotape. And this I did in LA, and it's lined with Chinese silk with a nice snap. And um, and I made this when I was living in LA, and I thought for the Academy Awards, everybody should make a, a bag out of their movies and wear them to the uh, parties. Great idea. <laughs> they didn't listen to me, no. Um, the other thing that I like to do is this is out of... Um, uh, netting from vegetables, uh, avocados and oranges and some synthetic material. And these are little soap pockets and you put your extra little bits, ends of soap and you have a little drawstring and you put it in the shower and you have a nice little piece of artwork in the shower and you can strut yourself with it. And you can also use it in the kitchen for washing your dishes. But I like this because it's, it's using, you know, I mean, this why 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 throw away the bits of soap when you can use them and these um the synthetic thing really makes a nice foam so that's good and then somebody else told me that you can use it as a tooth fairy bag which is also very good i told that to one of my students and she said her three-year-old daughter will say there's no tooth fairy so you can hang it on the christmas tree for a little gift bag too um, let's see what else. So that's for the crochet stuff. So you can send them, you can do the next slide. And now this, oh, then go back one. And this is um, Amish knotting. And oops, that's, that's it. And here's another, another sample too. Um, no, that's weaving. Go back one. There you go. Amish knotting is also called toothbrush knotting. And it act, I found out it has nothing to do with Amish. I don't know why it's called Amish knotting, but the toothbrush knotting, people used to cut off the ends of the, the toothbrush part, and it was a very narrow kind of a, a stick sort of thing, and then you can drill a hole in the end of it, and that's how you get your, um, that's how you get your thread through. Here is a piece that I'm working on now. I learned how to make it square. So, um, now the only trouble with Amish knotting is that it's very hard to take apart. You have to undo the whole thing. So this was my learning, my learning phase. And now I've got the squares, but it's, it's just one stitch. So you can imagine you can do a thing out of wire and tape or a toothbrush, but this is a popsicle stick. That's what I use. And, um, and the stitch is very simple. It's almost like a um, blanket stitch in embroidery. So you just, you go around, you go in the hole, you go through here. Oops, there's a knot in there. And you fiddle it. You, you do have to fiddle all of the Amish knotting. You kind of have to fiddle each stitch. But anyway, that's the basic stitch, and that goes for everything. And then the last slide is the weaving, I believe. And that is this piece that's over here. And this is all made of seams that I cut out from all the other clothes that I cut up to make stuff out of. And I couldn't throw the seams away <laughs> because 
I have a problem <laughs> um, throwing these things away. But it was also, um, I just I just like it. The seams are a little too heavy to make into the hats. You need something sort of soft and flexible for the hats. So I just saved the seams and then I use it for this weaving, which I just, I just did it on a, um, a painting stretcher and uh, just uh, warped it with uh, synthetic threads. So, so this is what we have been doing all week. And I have to say, people are really, it's not easy. All of these things, they're easy once you get going, but the first two rows of anything, I don't know if anybody's a knitter or a crocheter, but if you get past the first two rows, you're fine. But the first two rows are very difficult because you have to have exactly the right tension. So um, I have a few minutes. I just wanted to show you quickly some of the other things I do. Um, I make these earrings out of collage paper. They're all different and they're very lightweight so it doesn't hurt your ears. But um, I started out doing, um, doing pastels. I was a picture framer and then when I came to LA I took my mat boards down to the beach and started doing pastels. This is a, a gicle print of one of the pastels. This is actually in um, uh, in the Sierras. And then this is a, a picture, a, was a pastel, and this was in uh, the memory garden, the Shakespeare garden at in uh, Ash, Asheville, Ashland, Oregon. And this is a gicle. These are all gicle prints. And if anybody is admiring an original piece of artwork and you can't afford it or it's not the right size, have the artist make a gicle print because you can still, the artist will still get a nice bit of money, but you'll have a print any size that you want. This is, um, is a gicle of a piece on canvas. This was the view outside my cabin when I lived in the mountains for many years. And um, and then the recession came and I had to move. Okay, and now the next thing is, and this was a seascape. This is pastel. This is the original. And um, I I did a, all the artwork for a law office in Long Beach, and they liked this piece. It was all seascapes. It was right on the water. And they made this, they blew this up to a gicle. It was five feet long, and it looked fantastic. Pastel is a really good gicle medium. And I'll just show you one other thing. The other thing I do is collage. So this was, this is, this will go on a stretcher. And this I did for my corporate agent before the recession. And I would do tons and tons of these. And I had it so you could hang it vertical or horizontal. And I would do series of these, the same form. And a lot of offices liked it because they could hang it in hallways or stairways or all kinds of stuff like that. This is another collage. How am I doing on time? Am I okay? Okay, good. Um, this is a little, uh, a mirror from Ikea. And I don't want it to glare too much. Um, so I collage this and I put little feet on the back so you can hang it and a hook. So you can hang it on the wall for a mirror or you can put it on the table and have a little bud vase or a candle or something on the table. So I like all the multi-purpose kind of things. All right. Am I done? We're gonna head back to Linda. Okay. Bye Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Thanks for coming to my studio. That was wonderfully creative. Thank you very much. Judy is so creative. Um, our next artist is Lenora Canader. She has many art forms that she practices. She's taught uh, FEMO and uh, decorative pens, all kinds of things with us. And this year she came to us with needle felting uh, and she's doing landscapes with that. So I'm really interested to see what she and hear what her students are doing. So um, I'm, I have one of my paintings behind, behind me. Uh, it's the only one I framed. I was planning on framing all of them when we were gonna be on site, but I put that as a lower priority when we moved to Zoom. Uh, 
I started needle felting actually only a year ago, less than a year ago. Uh, no, a year, it was a year, it was less than a year from when I submitted the proposal. So a year and a half ago. And I started needle felting because I was trying to do something else. And like Judy, I'm very big in upcycling. And I had this blanket and it was a pink blanket. You can't really see the pink very much through it now. Um, and I was trying to learn to do eco printing of leaves because those of you who know me know that ginkgo is my totem. Uh, this is one of my polymer ginkgo necklaces. Um, and um, I saw these beautiful ginkgo prints. And so I decided to try it, not knowing that ginkgo is the hardest leaf of all to print. So I had these pieces of blanket that were kind of nothing. They, they weren't very interesting. So I had some roving, some hand-painted roving that I had uh, from taking one wet felting class. And I went out and bought some needles. And I took one of the pieces of, of a blanket and I did the first landscape. And I'm going to come here if I can share my screen. I will now start telling you about those. Okay, so I just had a header, but here is, where is it? Try again. I only see one slide in that slideshow, Lenora. Maybe there's a second file? Well, there was a whole, there was a whole slideshow. Okay. Um, Let's go back out and look to see your files and see um, you can do open recent. Okay. There you go. There, there I, they are. Okay. So we'll come here and see the first. You can step. share the slideshow from the beginning there. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Okay. There we are. So that was the very first a uh, needle felted painting I did. And the tree were snippets of alpaca that I had from unraveling a poncho that my sister had brought me from Bolivia when she came back from the Peace Corps in 1968 that had, had seen better days. And I made a bunch of alpaca socks with it, but there were these little pieces that were too small to knit. So they became this, and I posted it on Facebook, and a hundred people said, "Wow, that's wonderful! You have to do more of them." So I continued to do more of them. Um, I had been in Iceland, and there are some incredible rocks at a place called Vik on the south coast of Iceland. And well, I didn't have any black or dark brown or anything in the painted roving that I had, but I have a friend who has sheep. And she raises sheep for meat. Uh, she raises lambs for meat. So she shears the moms, but she doesn't do anything with the wool. It goes on her compost pile. So I rescued it from the compost pile, and I used the dark sheep color to make the rocks. And I had some sunsetty colors in the painted roving that were left, but I didn't have enough colors. So I started to learn how to dye. And I started to dye her white sheep wool. And ever since then, I've been working on using her wool. Um, so I dyed nice autumn colors. And that's also a lot of alpaca in there. That's an alpaca grove. And all these first pieces are of the order of eight by 10, a little more or a little less, because they were the size of 
the pieces of blanket that I had tried to do the eco prints on. And there. And then I decided to go in a slightly different direction. I had been in California and seen the desert in bloom. And so I did this one of the desert in bloom and I submitted it to the local senior art show and it won first prize in the craft category. So I was, that's the first prize I've ever won for anything. So I decided that maybe I had found my new medium. Not that I don't have stopped using polymer. So I started going bigger. And um, this one is 19 by 25. And it takes more than four times, five times, about five times as long to do a 19 by 25 as it does to do one that's eight by 10, because you've got much more uh, territory and you've got, you need to have a lot more wool. Um, in order to do that, I decided I needed a carter and I found a beautiful looking carter. Well, it was in England. So I went to England and bought a carter and went to the Shrewsbury Folk Festival and had a, a, a special birthday. It was an important birthday uh, at a farm to table restaurant. And so I have a little detail of this one. So you can see one of the things I like about needle felting is the relief aspect that it's not um, uh, it, it's not all flat. Uh, wet felting tends to be much flatter. And then the last one I finished uh, is uh, Mountain Birches. And that one is 16 by 21. And I have some detail of the birch as well. And right now I'm working on one that's um, even bigger. Um, I'm going to stop the share because that's the end of the share, um, which I've been working on with my students. But I had to, after seeing Judith's presentation, I had to show her some upcycling that I did in, um, as an experiment with the class today. Um, this is threads and snippets from a silk blouse that I got in a rummage sale. And I found <coughs> that they felt just fine, uh, fine too. So I'm, I think that's it for me. Thank you very much, Lenora. That's exciting that you found a, a new pa passion for your composition. You've always had your way with color. And it's fun to see you moving from the polymer with color into the felt with such brilliant color. Uh, Keith also uses quite a bit of color. He had a very successful week last week doing the split woven baskets. And this week he's doing the shaker seat weaving, which also incorporates, can incorporate rather vivid colors. Uh, Keith Taylor. Yeah, thank you, Linda. Uh, my name is Keith Taylor and I came to Common Ground about 12 years ago in search of a basket instructor. Um, I had been taking basket classes and my previous instructors had retired and I was looking for someone and I found Joy Shum at Common Ground. And one of the classes she offered was seat weaving, which was a natural transition from the basket making because it was all the same weaves and patterns that we did in basketry but now we could do it on a piece of furniture. So we started with a basic frame, either a stool or a chair. And then you use your shaker tape, which is a cotton uh, ribbon that either comes in five eighths or one inch. Um, I tend to like the, sh the smaller because you can do more with the pattern but I've found ways to incorporate both of those. So these are all continuous weaves, which is just like in um, basket making, it starts and you just keep going around and around. This is just a, a, a twill pattern, a two over two. 
Um, here's another one. This is made with ribbon. Uh, the red is the ribbon. And this is the project that I worked with with my student this week. I was using up some scraps, so I didn't have enough of any one color to do the whole chair So then, or stool. So I had to uh, come up with a pattern that would use the scraps that I had. So we can also put those on a chair. This chair here is tone on tone, and you can see the way the light is hitting it, how it makes the diamond pattern. So you're gonna to wanna to have an odd number so that you can have the center of the chair and the pattern of the diamond on there. There are lots of um, patterns that you can work out. So here is one that's uh, over three, under two, over one, under one, and then it repeats. And that's the pattern that you get from that. One of the things that I worked on also was a chair with my student. And I tried a technique that is called a chase weave, where I actually had two pieces going around at the same time, the blue and the tan. And so when I finished going uh, east, west, or side to side, it just looked like a striped chair. I did the same thing going north to south, and it created this, um, this chevron pattern in the, in the chair, and it was kind of like an accident. And then I could see it was hard for me to figure it out. My, uh, I kept seeing these mistakes in there, but then once the pattern started to jump out, it was easy to figure out what I needed to get, go over or under. Now, shaker tape is not the only thing that you can weave. A couple years ago when I took the class, I decided that my project was gonna be on seat weaving and not only just with the shaker tape, which you just seen, but with all sorts of um, other materials. So this is just a basket uh, reed that I use. This is a half inch basket weave, and then it was stained. Whereas this one here, same, but this is just in the natural. I've also done some with cane, and this is a twill pattern with the cane here, and this is fine, and this is super fine. And the chair, the rocker that you see back here, this was actually Linda's grandfather's chair. And this is what we call common cane. This is the widest of the cane. And it's just woven over under, just like you would with the shaker tape. Um, I also did rush, and this is a rush seat here. And I happen to have some of this paper, um, cording that people were using to un, unwrap and they would make uh, reeds and stuff out of it. And so I was able to incorporate the color because as Linda mentioned, I, I like color. I don't like things to be just plain. So even when I finished this stool, I went back with my color of um, reed and wove this in there after the fact, after the stool was all done, then I applied another layer to it. So when I was, with Joyce, oh wait, here's another, here's another stool that, this is a um, mission style that I gotten at a yard sale and I put the seed on there, that's a twill. Um, unfortunately, one of the things got broke in the move, but it'll be another project that I can do at another time. So I talked to Joyce and you know, it, it was her business. This is just my passion. It's just what I like to do when I'm, when I have time on my hands. And I started out with this um, stool and we were just talking and I said, Joyce, do you ever just get time to experiment and to play with this? Or is it always piecemeal? You need to hurry up and make something because you need to sell it. It's a business and it's not um, like, like a, a passion where you have time to play. And so we started out, I, well, I started out saying, well, this is what I would do, Joyce. I would like to try a, a start and a stop. So everything you saw up to this point was continuous, meaning I had one long piece and I just wrapped it around and then we went the other way. But this piece that I have here, here in front of me, this is a start and a stop. So each row just goes around and stops. And then after I had the wide, the one inch going north, south and east and west, then I took the five eighths and went over top of it to give it that texture, the dimension and add to the pattern. So as I started out describing this project to Joyce, I was saying, I, 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 
I would like to do this. I would like to do that. And then I said, and if we could do this, and if we could do that, and before I knew it, I had Joyce starting it and I was finishing it. And so this is what I call my we stool because we did it together. And I've seen her do a couple of those since then. Now that was all just wrapping it around, but I also, that year that I was doing chairs, I decided, okay, then I'm gonna also weave with cane using the whole cane. So I found a pamphlet that explained how to do it. And I had to find a chair and a friend of mine had these chairs and she was getting rid of them. I said, good, I'd like to have one just so I can play and do this. So I learned how to do the whole cane where it goes through the hole. And I think you go through it like five times each time. And that's that weaving. So that was kind of a smorgasbord of my weaving. Here's the, here's the stool in the cane that goes with the rocker and the little chair and the little baby chair. And you can see that sometimes I like color. I definitely like pattern. And that's seat weaving. Come and join us. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. I think everybody gets excited when they hear hear someone speak so passionately about how to use idle time. And Keith, you're certainly a man with no idle time. You have some of the busiest hands I know. Our next artist is a, a friend of mine. We, we are in love with making jewelry and metalsmithing in general. We worked with uh, a lot of the same people. Um, at one time, Gina was one of my art partners at Noma, and we've done Peter's Valley several times together. Uh, she is a brave metalsmith. She is the only metalsmith working with us virtually this summer. Gina Caponzi. Thank you, Linda. Um, I just wanted to say that um, this is my first year teaching at Common Ground. And tonight I'm going to talk about diminished diameter forging. But before I get into that technique, I just want to tell you my journey of coming to Common Ground. So about 10 years ago, I was introduced to this technique by Dawn Arterburn Cooney, who was a longtime apprentice of Linda Van Hart, and I believe Linda's only apprentice. And Dawn actually passed away five years ago this week and at Dawn's memorial service is where I met Linda Van Hart. So even though I lost my friend Dawn that day, I met Linda Van Hart. And I've also taken um, diminished diameter forging with Linda at Peters Valley a few years ago where I was able to immerse myself into um, this art again. Um, the tools that I use are mainly a rolling mill and a forging hammer. And um, the objective is to roll a thicker gauge wire, say a six gauge wire, and roll it down to a very thin, maybe 12 gauge wire, 10 gauge wire. I've rolled it down as thick as 20 gauges um, to make some earrings. So if we can go to the first slide. This is an overview of um, the neck shrug. So you could see the larger wire is thick on one end it's rolled down um, all the way down to about a 16 gauge wire. And then I added a second wire and a gemstone. Now, when you roll the wire down, it work hardens the wire and it also adds some memory to the wire. So you can um, make a very thin wire very strong and it actually um, puts a lot of spring and memory into the wire. So when you put this on, you put this on from the back, you slide it onto the front, it stays open in the front, it's very lightweight and it's super strong. If I were just to use a thinner wire, like a 16 gauge wire, it would never hold this shape. Um, we can go to the, the next slide now. So this is using the same technique with earrings. So um, I took a thicker gauge wire, I rolled it down to 20 gauges and then I forged the larger end um, and made it into this little sword shape. And then I was able to twist the wire around. So when you put the earrings on, it's almost like putting them on like a corkscrew. 
Um, but because the, the wire has been rolled down and it's very work hardened, um, it will keep the shape for the life of the earrings under normal wear that will never become distorted in shape because it's super hard. We could go to the third slide. Again, using this technique where I rolled down a thicker gauge to a thinner gauge. Now there's absolutely no solder in this bracelet at all. When I rolled it down to the thinner gauge, I wrapped the thinner gauge around and then on the larger size, I hammered it and I put a rivet to make a working hinge that opens and closes. But I actually made the bracelet large enough so I could slip it over my hand. So even though I have the look of the hinge, I wouldn't have to open and close the bracelet every time that I wanted to put it on. And you can see it gives it like a really nice sort of sleek, sleek streamlined look when you do this technique of going from a thicker gauge down to a thinner gauge. We could take a look at the next slide. All right, this is another neck shrug. I call it a neck shrug because it, it goes on from the back. And again, you can see the thicker gauge by the gemstone that was rolled down to a thinner gauge. And then I did roll a second piece of wire, not diminishing it, um, attaching everything together with a peridot gemstone. And then on the other side, I attached the two pieces together with another smaller gem so stone and twisting the wire together to give me a lot of spring and memory. So I just pull this on and pull it off and it'll never go out of shape. Now the last slide is um, a little bit different technique. I actually made this bracelet in Linda's workshop at Peters Valley, where we were challenged with diminishing both sides of the wire. So I took a six gauge wire and I rolled both sides down to about maybe a 16 gauge and I twisted it around, um, shaped it on a mandrel and this bracelet has absolutely no solder in it. I wear this bracelet every day. Uh, I've made a lot of others since this time, but this one is mine and I wear it every day. And um, it's very comfortable and lightweight and looks very simple, but there's a lot of labor put into this to roll that thick wire down to a thin wire. Um, that's actually my last slide. Um, I did want to say if you have any questions or if you want to see more of my work, you can follow me on Instagram um, at GMC Designs or on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash GMC Designs. I'd like to hear from you, your comments or um, any questions that you might have. And I just wanted to thank everybody at Common Ground on the Hill for inviting me this year and for also all the back behind the scenes things that you're doing to make this possible for me to even be here tonight to give you this talk. So back to you, Linda. Thank you, Gina. We're in your studio, aren't we? Could we just yes, take a look? My messy studio. Are you, that's all right. I know you're teaching from it. Are are you working with a webcam as I well am. as your Zoom program? I don't on your have laptop. I, I, I do have a webcam that I can move around my studio. I could turn some lights on here and show it to you. It is a little messy, so please forgive that. Okay. Um, over here is my soldering station. Can you see that okay? Because I can't really yeah. see what's on the camera. And then over here, I have everything covered up, but under the green bag is my rolling mill. And in the corner is my hydraulic press. And I have my buffing wheel over here. And if we turn around, this is where a lot of the magic happens, right here at my mom's old hutch, which I started out with this, and I love to use this. My drill press. Um, over here is another jeweler's bench. Opposite of that is another jeweler bench that I have my, GR, my GRS system attached to. And then, of course, I have this big table with uh, all my junk piled up there. Um, my pickle stations over here and another workbench over there with my belt sander. And I pretty much have tools all over this place. <laughs> but uh, it was organized until uh, until today. <laughs> but uh, that's it. Dina and I uh, we we have christened ourselves. Uh, my first apprentice, Don Arta Bernkuni, who was uh, one of Gina's early teachers, um, we 
we became the tool queens and I've adopted Gina. She is now one of the tool queens. We are the tool queens. I am. And we take tool queen field trips. <laughs> so this has been a fantastic talk. A lot of the evenings we, we have uh, a difference between what could be considered a fine art, normally something that doesn't have function. It hangs on a wall or it sits on a pedestal. And last night we had the great good fortune to contrast fine art, big freestanding or relief sculpture against more crafted sculpture. And this evening we're looking at the fine art of craft, well-crafted pieces. With Lenora, hers have the semblance of two-dimensional art, which is painting. And you can see uh, behind her that she has one framed and it's hanging. But with Judy's pieces, they're hats, they're bags, they're very functional items with keys items, they're chairs, they're stools, they're antiques that, that you can use. And both he and Judy have upcycled antiques and Lenora has done some of that. With Gina's hit or miss, of course, what she's doing is wearable and functional. Um, but sometimes the question of value comes into whether it's a fine art or craft because she's using precious metals. Anybody have comments on craftsmanship, the fine art versus the craft? That's always the question. And, and I've come to realize uh, in art school, you know, don't ever say you do decorative artwork. That's like a big no-no. That's not the real thing. But especially since the quarantine, I've become more enamored with things that people actually live with so that it's functional and that it's decorative. And it's, you know, who's going to go to a gallery and get something right now? You can get stuff online and a lot of people are doing it, but everybody's looking at home. And, and a lot of the stuff that I was making is from my studies at the Shelburne Museum in, in Vermont, which was a craft and folk art museum. And I studied it, didn't really absorb all of it, but as I'm getting older, I'm realizing the value of all the crafts that people made to just furnish their lives. And it, as far as I'm concerned, it's just as important as the fine art gallery stuff, which I like to sell too, but you know, that's it. I don't, I don't sell any of my uh, craft. I feel like they're all uh, have a, a purpose. They're utilitarian, but also they, I try to make them beautiful and match the decor of my home so that they add to the beauty of the house. So that's why I like to use the colors and the patterns that you see. And you see a lot of blue in my um, my stools and my chairs. Can so, we see the back of the stool? I want to see the, the underneath. The back of this stool? Well, yeah. this, this actually has an underside. This just, um, it wrapped around, it comes over, twist, wraps around, and comes back up. So oh. even though it is continuous, it doesn't have an underside like, this stool. Fascinating. So Gorgeous. This stool is the same on either side because it just goes right on around and continues right, right, pattern. Right. Beautiful. Well, I thought it was really interesting uh, to see uh, Gina's uh, pieces that, that are for neck, neck pieces because I've gone the same direction. <laughs> you know, all of my neck pieces go around from the back, but I've incorporated magnets as well oh. so that they can fasten in different ways depending on what the neckline is of the that you're wearing. And they're all reversible. Wow, that's nice. Wow. And Lenora, I actually made a necklace very similar to that in metal with ginkgo leaves. So well, lots of translates. people love ginkgo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gina, I had a question. What well, when, you, are you, are you, when you say you roll the metal, what does that mean? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? When you say you roll the metal, what does that mean? Yes, so I have a rolling mill 
that actually reduces the diameter of the metal from, I usually start with about a six gauge and I can roll it all the way down to a 20 gauge. So um, there's different slots on the rolling mill and I can keep reducing it, but instead of reducing the whole piece, I reduce a little bit at the time. So at the end, I'm, I wind up with a tapered piece, larger on one side and smaller on the other side. And that's how I get that um, able to wrap things around. It's all one piece. For someone looking at it, they might think it's multiple pieces, but it's really just one piece, just all diminished with a hammer and a rolling mill. Beautiful. One of my favorite techniques. It's not yes. easy. It's not e easy to do that. So with between the upcycled ingredients that people run down a sidewalk and hand to Judy and the, <laughs> the, right. the silver gemstones that Gina uses, we've got a very wide range in the price of materials of construction. Uh, how do you feel that influences the price of the work if you're actually going to offer it for sale or, or its value? You talking to me? Um, Judy, I know you market your work and so does Gina. So perhaps yeah. the two of you could speak to that. Well, the I don't think you ever really get your value. It's really hard to get your value on craft work because it could take you five times longer than a large landscape, which people will give you more money for a large landscape. And also the value of small pieces, which are so precious and you can't charge as much for a small piece as you can for a large piece. There was, um, I, I heard about this time bank situation where people, they just trade time for time, hours for hours. So. If you want somebody to give you brain surgery or you want somebody to paint your porch, but everybody's hours are equal. And that group had a gallery and everything was marked by the hours. So if somebody wanted to buy whatever, you put down how many hours it took you and they had to trade hours with you so that everybody's time was equal. But that's not the real world, unfortunately. Yeah, and um, just to answer your question, Linda, about the precious metals. So, you know, when you're working with silver and you're working with gold and you're working with gemstones, before I even get started, my piece could be several hundred dollars. I could pay over a hundred dollars just for a gemstone. And then when you add in all the hours, um, it really does start adding up. So I sometimes um, charge less for my labor to try to make the pieces more affordable, but um, that's just sort of the nature of it. I mean, I, a piece could a piece could start out at several hundred dollars before I've even done anything to it. So, um, it gets I, I hear you. I I think uh, the value of a piece in the in the eye of the maker um, may be different than in the eye of the beholder it's always nice when you when you get a collector who really appreciates your skill i have people that say to me wow i really like that piece it's an awful lot of money how long did it take you to make that piece and i have to say all my life yes <laughs> without the jewelry i was making with scrap wire out of my grandfather's shop and a seashell I found on the beach when I was five or six years old to now I'm using some of the same techniques because early on I learned how to wrap wire and it's a primary technique in my work still today. So, like, you know, when you take into consideration, I said to one person, I said, how much do you pay your plumber an hour? Because right. they just had a lot of work done and they thought about it. Well, it's And like, I said, you know, <laughs> I've been yeah. making these pin cushions, these take me, I don't know how many hours. It's all hand embroidered. And, you know, it's like everybody needs a hundred dollar pin cushion, right? <laughs> but I have little hangers, you hang it on the wall. And when you, ha you can also, some people have gotten them and they just put a piece of jewelry in the middle. And that's how they hang that piece of jewelry. It's like a frame for the jewel, that one piece of jewelry. And also just when you're working and you have the threads hanging down, it's so much more practical than just sitting on the table and being a big mess. 
but I start, I just, I just made about 10 of these. And it's like, how am I, I'm never going to sell these. I mean, I probably will give them as gifts, but I, you know, who's going to pay $150 for a pin cushion and that's cheap. Yeah. I there are definitely many things that I have, have made where I could never sell them. Yeah. I only make them. I enjoy making them, but I, I know that they wouldn't carry a price that made it worth my time. So I only make them for myself or friends or for gifts. Right. And there are other things that I, I figured out very much what it, what it takes to, to make them and to be able to sell them at a reasonable price for my time. Right. Yeah, that's why I, I have all of my, uh, most of my baskets if I haven't given them away. But the time and the material cost in this, it almost becomes prohibitive to sell it because I would be practically giving it away and losing money in the process. So I do it for me. I don't do it because it's a business. I do it for me because I think they're beautiful to look at and yet they still have a purpose that I can put stuff in them. Well, I appreciate the, the skill, the imagination, the creativity that you all have brought to tonight's gallery talk. Thank you very much. Tomorrow night, please join us at 6.30. <clears throat> We're having a presentation and then a panel discussion by our weavers, our knitters, our spinners, our petal loom weavers, <clears throat> because like several of our programs, a lot of people don't have looms at home. They don't have potter's wheels at home. They don't have oxyacetylene torches at home. <laughs> so except for those very brave imaginative people like those you've heard speaking tonight, <clears throat> many of our courses had to be rolled over for 2021 and we're hoping we will gather in person to wet your whistle because we had looms all lined up. We had spinning wheels lined up. So to wet your whistle and become informed more about our fiber program, please join us uh, tomorrow night. Nancy McKenzie, Melissa Weaver Dunning, Gwen Handler, the queen of the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival, and Marjorie Erickson are going to talk to us about the wonderful world of fiber. Please join us. And don't miss the concert a little later tonight at 8 o'clock. It was great last night. Another one coming up. I'm Linda Van Hart, Visual Arts Coordinator for Common Ground on the Hill. Thank you for joining us for the gallery talk. We'll see you tomorrow night at 6.30.